I would now like to ask Justin Manley, um, who is moderating the first panel, um, to come up and uh, say some words and introduce this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Ooh, I'm live. If the panelists would uh, please come on up. So we're going to make sure that one doesn't interfere. So welcome. Uh, you know, I recognize as we sort of look at ourselves here, we, we probably feel like that small boat in a big ocean. Um, so there'll be some more folks coming from the back, I assure you. I have been told the, the, the hordes are coming. Um, no, this is also live streamed and, and online. So uh, to everybody who's interested in the topic, welcome. I'm thrilled to bring technology innovation to this audience and to the audience on the screen and the audience who doesn't know what they're missing when they're missing it. Marine protected areas are too often unprotected. The ocean is vast and challenging to all forms of human presence. The technologies that we're discussing here are providing new ways to bring our senses and our awareness to these important areas. You may note, if you've been looking, that this panel includes three CEOs, uh, one wannabe CFO, but he assures me he is a CEO. Um, the reason for that is that industry recognizes this is an important topic. Industry understands and cares about the needs of ocean conservation. Also thrilled to welcome WildAid with their deep expertise in MPA management and concerns. So we've got a great panel. I'm gonna spare you formal introductions. Uh, instead, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna ask each of our panelists to take a few moments to introduce themselves and their organization. They've got a few remarks and slides they'll work through, after which we'll get into a bit of a discussion. Um, this is a intimate crowd, so you in the audience should feel welcome to bring some questions forward. We'll sort of figure out how to get those um, vocalized as well. Um, so don't make me ask the first question. I'd ask you all to prepare. So with no further ado, I think what I do is I hand this over to Julie. And do you want to, why don't you sit and do your remarks? Can you do that? We're all just going to sit here very casual-like. So Julie, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Uh, very nice to be here, and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about the role that uh, uncrewed surface vehicles can play in marine protected area monitoring and the work that we've done. Uh, I think one of the key advantages to technology like this is that it can be deployed in an affordable manner. It is scalable with the ability to deploy many of these USVs, and it's sustainable. Uh, no greenhouse gas emissions, no risk of oil spills, and very uh, quiet vehicles. And in terms of our USV, it's, a, it's about the size of an average kayak. It has covered with solar panels, it's self-riding, and it's able to go for days at a time, weeks at a time, or even longer, collecting a range of data with its very modular platform for sensor integration. Uh, it's um, very capable in uh, big seas. It has a self-writing system that allows it to uh, write itself when it capsizes, but it's also very capable in shallow waters, uh, so it can cover broad areas of the ocean um, very effectively. And we have a, a, a core sensor suite that's um, really targeted towards a lot of different applications using cameras and other sensors. So that could be providing maritime situational awareness, detecting vessels, um, collecting oceanographic and environmental data, and then additional sensors that can be customized for the range of data applications that might be of interest. And now we've worked in a few different areas for illegal fishing protection, monitoring marine mammals, and detecting other security threats. And I just want to really briefly talk about um, MPA Bots, which is a project that we uh, did. It was supported by OceanKind and in collaboration with WildAid. And the goal of this is really to scale this type of technology for widespread deployment eventually in MPAs. For this, we did a 25-day con continuous mission monitoring a region in, in near Hawaii, um, a, a marine sanctuary, to demonstrate the abilities of a platform like this. We had a, a range of sensors, including cameras, acoustics, environmental, and oceanographic uh, sensors. And we were able to showcase how a, a solar-powered USV can go out for persistent mission and collect this type of data in a range of conditions, including some challenging waves and, and wind states. 
Um, they're autonomous or remotely piloted, so there's somebody observing it. In this case, we had people in our control room in Victoria, BC, as well as an on-site team. And we, we streamed back and stored a range of data. Some of that is visual, detecting boats with our optical cameras as well as thermal cameras, um, detecting AIS signals, uh, a, a range of environmental monitoring, including having an underwater camera. And I think um, you know it's a good demonstration where we are now. And I think in the future, if we're able to scale technology like this, it really has the potential to address some of the challenges with monitoring MPAs, especially remote um, large MPAs. So very excited to be part of this panel. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Next up is Eric Jackson from Cellular Robotics. Yeah, thanks. I just speak better when I'm standing up. So All you I'm men. Okay. <laughs> Old school. That's OK. Yeah. <gasps> Um, I, I wanted to say that I was inspired by Cindy Boyko's talk, and um, one, one thing that, this may seem silly to you, but it's not silly to me. Um, I'm part of a community of ocean engineers, ocean robotics engineers, and so I've been doing this for over 40 years, and the company I started with had been around for quite a few years before I joined. And um, in 2001, I formed my own company, Cellular Robotics, as a one-person consultancy. And I just wanted to mention, people sometimes ask, why do you call it Cellula? And the reason it's called Cellula is because I wanted to get the name Cellular Robots, or Robotics, because Cellular, robotic, cellular Robots are uh, an area of constant um, research and development, and those are robots that are designed to come together to work on a problem and solve it together. So I just thought that was a great analog for a new company in the robotics field. So we've grown to uh, a larger group now. We have um, about 65 people. This just shows the, the types of things that we're doing. So in the background are two large autonomous underwater vehicles or uncrewed underwater vehicles. And they're both designed to be very long range, uh, long endurance vehicles. Um, they have, the one in the middle with the orange top has a hydrogen fuel cell in it and the other one is designed for a hydrogen fuel cell. But the, so the smaller one in front um, has a range of about 2,000 kilometers. So it can stay underwater for a long time and do, uh, do things that are currently not possible with this type of vehicle. So we're talking about port-to-port -port operations, so rather than deploying vehicles from, uh, from a big um, smoke-belching survey vessel, that um, it could be potentially tracked by a a vessel such as Open Ocean Robotics and to get some position updates. And uh, so it's net zero solution with um, 21st century capabilities. Um, the other ones, in, the smaller ones in front are hovering autonomous underwater vehicles. So those ones are designed to position themselves relative to their environment so they can they look around to see what they can see in their environment and they position themselves carefully and accurately relative to those things. The common thread in both of these types of vehicles is that they're underwater for long periods of time and you cannot, you do not have a high bandwidth communication system. There's no underwater GPS, there's no underwater Wi-Fi, it's low bandwidth, the vehicles have to be smart but they, um, they solve other problems by doing that, by not being connected to the surface by a cable. So this is a bit of history. Um, we recently uh, uh, sold our division that makes the um, seafloor geotechnical drills, like on the upper left. You can see the two Solus vehicles. Um, the um, Solus LR funded by Defense R&D Canada, the bottom right is designed for a 5,000 kilometer mission. Um, the Amodis vehicles, the one called Amodis T, which is used for 
serving inside um, above ground storage tanks. So people, you don't have to actually drain all the hydrocarbons out of the tank to inspect the inside. So in marine protected areas, um, we have a couple of projects that are just starting up to use the Solus long range vehicle, the hydrogen powered one to, to um, first of all is, is characterizing ocean soundscapes. So that's funded by Transport Canada. And so the idea is to get some initial background readings on on uh, subsea noise from, it, and including vessel traffic in the proximity of the areas that we're working. And then the second one is surveying and imaging of um, marine protected areas such as glass sponge reefs and rockfish conservation sites. And that is funded by Fisheries and Oceans. So Shift Environmental, uh, two representatives of which are here today, are a partner of ours on this. They are, um, our environmental consultants and also our um, consultants on indigenous uh, community involvement. And uh, VOICE is, uh, is a main part of the Fisheries and Oceans Canada project. They're providing subsea imaging cameras and lasers and Ocean Sonics providing subsea um, high, high bandwidth, high range, um, acoustic monitoring capabilities for the Qu Quiet Vessel Initiative project. So with the Soundscapes project, the Solus LR vehicle will have two hydrophones mounted on it, and it will deploy, the vehicle is large enough to deploy a subsea listening station. So that'll be dropped on the seafloor in the area of interest and um, that device will record sound for an extended period of time, then we'll go back and get it later and get the data from it. And uh, for the imaging and surveying project, there's a big interest in surveying glass sponge reefs um, using the voice camera and laser system and also the uh, rockfish conservation areas. There's this is, this is um, you can call it a prototype test survey because we're quite concerned with glass sponge reefs. We don't want to take this large vehicle and, and uh, just fly it around two meters above the seafloor because we might be crashing into some of them. So the other vehicles I showed you earlier, which are designed to survey relative to the environment, uh, we need to be able to find the kind of sensors like whether it's subsea radar, or sorry, LIDAR or uh, laser or acoustics that can actually position and detect these sponge, glass sponges without us crashing into them and breaking them. These large vehicles with extended range capabilities are designed for light logistics operations. So they're, as I mentioned, they're not intended to operate with a large survey vessel that's typically required because your autonomous underwater vehicle run on battery power and then when the battery's depleted, it comes to the surface, the vessel takes it on board, recharges the battery. We have enough power on board to go 2,000 kilometers so that we're changing that um, completely and enabling the vehicles to be um, underwater for extended periods of time. And also because of the light logistics uh, capability for launching and recovering the vehicle, we feel it's a good platform for deploying from coastal communities in British Columbia. Um, yeah, thank you. Good, thanks Eric. Next up we have Derek. Uh, you're gonna stand, you're gonna sit, it's up I'm, to you. I'm gonna stand because I need a place to put my notes. Okie doke. <laughs> Derek is gonna talk to us about another company here in the area, Seahawk Robotics.
All right, so hi, I'm, uh, I'm Derek from Seahawk Robotics, and we develop multi-domain robotic systems that maximize access and minimize contact to sensitive habitats. Our company is dedicated to developing state-of-the-art, uncrewed aerial systems that can fly, land on water, deploy sensor payloads, and make informed decisions on the data collected. This provides a cost-effective solution um, for monitoring and surveying large amounts of ocean uh, in order to preserve marine protected areas. So let me show you how. Carrying sensors by air offers deployment from land, vessel, or platform, faster response for studying time-sensitive events, and improved access to landlocked or shallow waters. The ability to land on water allows us to dip sensors in and out, greatly reducing contact with delicate environments. When passively floating and monitoring, buoyancy replaces lift, and our system saves energy not maintaining flight, which significantly extends the endurance of the system compared to other drones. Taking a look at a few case studies, um, when used for measurement and sampling, we can collect large data sets over a very large area quickly, uh, extend the range of vessels, uh, buoys, and other platforms, uh, and cooperate with other systems on the surface and underwater. These ab abilities benefit marine protected areas by measuring and monitoring key environmental parameters and helping to identify pollution and or other environmental hazards. Another example, and our primary focus, is acoustic monitoring. By equipping drones with acoustic sensor arrays and signal processing, we can track the movements and behaviors of marine mammals, rapidly reposition listening devices for optimal localization, monitor for illegal fishing and other human activities that may harm marine ecosystems, and provide visual con confirmation by air. This information can be used to inform conservation and management decisions such as identifying areas that need greater protection or monitoring. In response to these applications, we've been developing the F4 floating quadcopter. This vehicle flies, floats, and deploys sensor arrays using a proprietary onboard winch. It can be launched from land, vessel, or platform, and quickly access and vacate otherwise unreachable areas. It can record and transmit data to the control station, which allow support vessels or other, um, other control stations to remain stationary, saving energy and reducing the inherent carbon footprint uh, of collecting vital data needed for, to protect our oceans. The system is easily reconfigurable for a wide array of payloads, including various sensors, hydrophones, echo sounders, acoustic modems, and even other small vehicles. Overall, this advancement will aid in providing a comprehensive and detailed understanding of a marine environment and support the conservation and management efforts that are so critical to the future of our planet. And there's a lot more too. Our technology also includes a, submergent, a submersible drone, which was actually our first prototype we built in 2018, and a standalone modular winch, which is new for 2023, which en enables deployment and recovery of sensor payloads from aerial and surface vehicles. I'm excited to say that it's undergoing field tests this month. So if you have any questions and, or just want to chat, please come find me. Here's my info. Thanks, Derek. And Bob, you're, Bob's going to stand too. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I wouldn't stand in front of you. I'll use the phone. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much, Justin. I'm Bob Farrell. Uh, and I'm not a technology developer. I'm a consumer. So we're going to share a little bit of my insight. I'm a consumer in terms of a specific task that I'm trying to accomplish. So the thing that I'm trying to do is help enforcement. And so a lot of you technology providers are helping to develop tools that we can use as officers in the field. Um, we're gonna start using this guide uh, to try and identify what's above the boat uh, when we're out there. I'm sure the fishermen will make use of something like this as well. So one of the gold standards for collection of data is obviously visual, right? So I always try to throw up a picture and 
ask the crowd, well, what violations do you see? What kind of information is presented in this really good visual image uh, that we could use as enforcement? And I usually get a lot of answers from the crowd, but at the end of the day, this is a great image, but it's not really helpful, right? There's no numbers, there's no identifying, uh, you know, information that we could use above and beyond what you see right there. So it's a piece of the puzzle, but it, we need more. We need more from some of the technologies that you guys are providing or developing. So when we talk about technologies, we talk about their usefulness and what they can detect or what they can uh, document. You know, uh, we talk about vessels, vessels on the ocean. There's very few places within our marine protected area networks that exclude vessels. So if you detect a vessel in a particular area in one of these MPAs, they could be there legally. Uh, and so we need more information. What are they doing? It may be a gear difference. It may be a species difference that uh, their activity really needs to be quantified. So how do we do that? Think about this as you develop your tech. It's not just about detecting a vessel, it's about detecting a vessel and trying to figure out what that vessel is doing. So currently, we have a lot of great stuff to draw upon. We have VMS, AIS, there's a lot of ways to detect a vessel's position, but that's again a snapshot in time. So we don't really have an idea of what that vessel is actually doing. We can make some assumptions based on that vessel's assumed course and speed because each one of these data points is a snapshot in time. If we calculate uh, you know, the difference between one data point and another data point, we make an assumption on the vessel's course and speed. May not be true, it's an assumption. So uh, moving that further into de defining fisheries activity, again, these algorithms are very sophisticated and we can make an assumption on that vessel's activity, but we don't know for sure. Again, another representation. We have very accurate data on that vessel's position, but it's a snapshot in time. Again, we get really good images. This is one image that might be captured from a variety of technologies that you guys are employing. USVs, keep this, keep this image in mind. Here's another image. This is a lot better. Now we have definite identifying characteristics. We can show certain activity that would definitely denote fishing. If this particular vessel was uh, in a marine protected area or in an area where trawling wasn't permitted, this is probably a really good uh, element to our case package. And again, it's the tech, right? I put this up there because I don't know what's being developed. I don't know what the future holds. And so anything that helps us determine that vessel's activity is a good thing. Whether that's acoustic, whether it's visual, any other thing that gives us more information about that event and the activity of that vessel is, uh, is welcome. The other thing we want to talk about is detection versus what happens next, a very important piece of this big puzzle. So once we detect a vessel, what do we do next? Do we have a plan for response? Is there a way to guide assets in there? Do we need to put boots on the deck? Are there some regulatory aspects of your technology that can be, uh, that we can use outside of putting boots on the deck? For instance, can we say that just, um, you know, disabling a VMS or an AIS is a violation in and of itself? Many regulatory schemes do that, but the enforcement of that particular regulation is weak. So think about companion regulations for your technology as well, because you're not always going to detect that illegal act. And that's the picture, a close-up of the vessel I showed you. That's me on the bow a few years ago. Uh, so if you have any questions or whatever, that's me. That's my email. Uh, again, uh, it's enforcement that we're interested in as a consumer, and I hope to see some of your technology implemented in the near future. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. So um, this was a very brief introduction to a, certainly a, a rich and robust topic area. And uh, we've got a, you know, not quite half an hour here to spend digging in. We're, we're going to do some Q&A and some discussion. I wanted to make an observation that sort of, I guess this is obvious, but listening to all of you, and, and it shouldn't surprise anyone, I'm friends with all these folks. We collaborate at various levels, right? So we all sort of have known each other um, sometimes for many years sometimes just for, you know, re more recently. 
And every time I sit down with one of these folks or listen to them present, I'm always learning something new or finding some new subtlety um, to what, what they bring to the table or what the challenge is, right? So I think that the key, I'm, I'm laying all this out to sort of comment that we're talking a lot about robots. Bob did remind us, and Bob's last photo was of Bob. Bob is a person. Um, we've got a lot of robots here. We like robots, we like tech, but people, it, people are really important in this equation too, right? So I just, I just want to bring that up because I know when we talk about marine protected areas and use cases, you know, um, there's a lot of other things involved, right? So quick comment on that. So I, I will, um, I'm gonna launch with a couple of questions here, but, but as folks, uh, if you do feel a, a need to get a question in the mix, uh, don't be shy, sort of catch my eye or something and we'll, we'll figure out how to get you involved in the conversation. The, the place I wanna start with this discussion is I wanna build on Bob's discussion of applications and use cases, right? The, the tools are only as good as what we can do with them. Um, so what I'd like the speakers to talk about, and this can be both practical lived experience or you know, maybe it's something you've heard about, but I wanna start talking about the challenges you may see, sort of, and let's balance the specificity of robot geek equations uh, with a general purpose audience, but like what, what are you seeing challenging your technology? You've got vision, you've got ambition, but what kind of challenges do you see in transitioning these technologies to end use cases? We're here talking about MPAs. Let's just talk ocean conservation, ocean science. Like I'm giving you an open-ended aperture to talk about the challenges you're, you're seeing, and maybe if you've got some specific ideas about how you're solving those challenges, I think that'd be an interesting thread of conversation. So I know you didn't know that question was coming. I know you can all handle it. But what? <laughs> this is where one of you gets to raise your hand or just start speaking. <laughs> Go Bob. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna take it real quick. So one of the challenges we face, uh, and it was, I liken it to DNA evidence that we, you know, everybody accepts that now, but um, at the beginning, there it was subject to much scientific rigor with, um, you know, experts coming in and testifying to the accuracy of DNA evidence. So a lot of the things that your technologies are providing in terms of information while maybe not as complex as DNA, will still require illustration or expert witness of proprietary information, right? So the way you got that information with your technology, in order for it to meet evidentiary standards, it may require you to go to court and prepare testimonies and expert witness. And I found some reluctance to not only provide that, but also maybe at times disclose some proprietary information that you as a tech provider may have you know, involved with your tech. And it may be as simple as an algorithm that calculates position relative to your piece of equipment. But those are things that are important as we move forward with information that can be used in court. You may be required to prepare those types of testimonies. You may be required to give those types of testimonies and prove the accuracy of your technology. You know, think, it's a good one. Yeah, another one of the challenges when you're uh, developing new technology and using it in new situations is the interaction of that technology with the end users because it is all about the people. And so fitting into the existing resources, whether it's um, the existing way of making detections, transmitting that information to the people who need to access it, and also um, having, encouraging, um, you know, a trust in that new technology. Does this new technology work as well as the existing way of collecting data? Are there risks to this technology, you know, with, autonomous vehicles, you know, are there risks in terms of, you know, collisions or, uh, you know, inaccurately getting data. So I think a really important thing is being able to work with the end users and ensure that there is trust and deploy it in a way that meets their goals. Because this is another tool that we have to meet the goals of the end user who is a person, not a robot. We'll come back to these guys. So this is audience participation time. Anybody driven a car with radar-based cruise control, right? Do you trust it? It turns out I've fallen in love with mine and I trust it implicitly, but that's because I'm an engineer geek and I actually like tested it and played with it and like while I don't know the code that's underneath it, I think I know how it works, right? So this trust thing I think is a really powerful one 
for all these technologies. But sorry, Eric, dive in here. Yeah, so there's, there's many areas I could discuss that are challenging. The, the big one that's uh, most interest to me also is the fact that when we're working underwater, I mentioned in my presentation, we don't have real-time communications to the vehicle except maybe super, super slow communications. Like anyone who's ever remembered a telex machine. That's the, we've got less bandwidth than a telex machine talking <laughs> to the vehicle, and that's only over short ranges. Um, and then how does the vehicle know where it is? There's no GPS in the ocean. So the navigational, um, the navigational challenges are uh, interesting, fascinating, expensive. And then, so, I've spent, I, f I consider myself a bit of an expert on autonomous systems and I know what autonomy means. And autonomy means lack of supervision required to do a given job. So if I've got two machines that do the same job, one of them requires a person with joysticks and the other one just somebody just tells it to do something and it comes back, that one's more autonomous. So everything's about doing, a, a, as Julie says, doing a specific task. So how do we actually tell the robot what task we want it to do? And then when the robot sees something, like how can it, we, we can tell it, do this until you see something interesting and then, and then I'll tell you what to do. So how do you actually program that into a robot? How do you make it work? And then how do you train a user to, um, to make that robot work for them? And so that, that kind of goes into my second bit, which is the user interfaces to autonomous systems. And um, we talked about trusted autonomous systems. The user has to trust them. And the other element of that is reliability. They need to trust that it's reliable and it's, uh, Justin trusts his car, other people don't trust their cars, maybe because yours has radar and other people use cameras, and we don't need to mention any names, but... Um, <laughs> uh, so reliability of systems, like with our subsea fuel cells, we're, we're putting hydrogen fuel cells in the ocean, and there's a lot of challenges to that. Why can't you just go and buy one that goes in an AUV? Well, we would if we could, so we're developing them, and then, oh. That wasn't fit for purpose. That bit wasn't fit for purpose. So it's a, there's a lot of development. It's expensive. It's expensive to take vehicles to the ocean, put them in the water, and uh, do your experiments and come back. Great insights, Eric. Thanks. Derek, if you want to chime in with any thoughts here. Uh, you know, my answer is, is kind of an add-on to both Julie uh, and Eric's here. Um, our technology is, uh, is a little bit of a, more of a newcomer to the scene. Uh, and for the last uh, four years, we've been uh, sussing out different applications for it. Um, but like Eric said, it is very expensive to develop something that is trusted in a marine environment. Um, so if you're bringing a new technology, uh, you immediately face the challenge of, of trust in your, in your equipment. So I guess we're all worried about trust. <laughs> <laughs> we got trust issues, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, um, I think, you know, again, for folks who may be uh, new to the tech space, or, or again, if you think about it from the MPA space, um, a brief, brief sideways walk here, but if you think about it, we as a society decide that we're gonna make an area, a marine protected area, right? What does that mean? Well, somebody, some form of government declared something drew some lines, ends up on a chart, folks like Bob or colleagues like Bob get assigned to sort of ensure that that, that area is now protected, right? And then at the end of the day, that chain of, of where's the societal involvement to the technology involvement, right? Because at the end of the day, we've got a bunch of companies here who are in business, right? Need to, need to pay the bills. You've heard some references to things that are expensive. Everyone wants to do this in a best value way. So that interplay of the technology development, the end user requirement, and, and trust not just in the hardware, but in are the users gonna use it in the right way, and if not, are we gonna work with them, right? So there's a lot of complexities here. The good news, 
right, is, I, as I sit here and listen, and, and Eric's been doing this a little bit longer than me, but uh, we'll probably remember, uh, he references GPS, the first ocean robot I built didn't have GPS, yeah. right, because it used to be you didn't have GPS. You couldn't afford it, and if you could afford it, it took up half of one of those tables, right? I mean, so this is, and that's not all that long ago, right? So the tech is getting better. We've got companies here who are trying to, to bring the cost and complexity down to address these issues. So no, it was a great, thank you for, for indulging that bit of discussion. Gonna, gonna change gears a little bit, because that, uh, that, that went a little downer, and I wanna get a little, we're all wearing gray. We all know that we're wearing gray. We wanna bring some positive energy here. So I'm, I'm instead gonna ask everybody to comment on the application, the end use um, that you've either seen or are considering for, for your technology or new technology in an MPA that you're most excited about. Like, this is the potential thing. The Tony Stark thing was great, right? Like, you know, um, what's, the, what's the cool thing you see coming or the cool thing you think your tech is gonna do to actually deliver on marine protected areas and the promise that that, that entails? Well, Dive in. we're decarbonizing ocean operations. So that's, that's very interesting. I, I think it's great um, being able to, to send autonomous vehicles out for extended periods of time um, that can monitor marine protected areas, um, supervise, watch for changes, and, um, and then come back with data or go to the surface and send reports about things that don't look right, go back down again, maybe swap one vehicle out with another one. I think um, the whole decarbonization um, is, is huge. We won't need to have big survey vessels out on the ocean trying to support such platforms. There's kind of a twofer there, right? So one is like the decarbonization, which means the very act of protecting the planet is not hurting the planet, right? And yeah. then as business folks, taking the ship out of the equation reduces capital expenditure, reduces operations expenditure, some human beings may no longer make their living going to sea. Maybe they go sit in Julie's control room in Victoria. They're yeah. still making a living. They're just not at sea, so they're sipping yeah. coffee and not getting sick, yeah. right? So yeah, I think they're, you just laid out. bunker fuel consumption. Yep, yep. <laughs> and, but while we're at it, we're actually doing the right thing, which is yeah. protecting the MPA. No, great one. Other, other things that excite people. Yeah, Derek. Um, so I'm really excited about the ability to just extend the range of existing solutions that are out there. Um, I think in the first couple of years when we, when we first started developing our technology, a lot of others would look at us like, oh, do you think you're going to replace a ship? Do you think you're going to replace a surface vessel? And, and that was never the idea uh, for us. The idea was always to extend the range and allow them to operate in spaces that are, are difficult to access for a survey vessel, for example. So. Right on. Julie? Yeah. Um, so I think there's lots of potential for, you know, our solar-powered autonomous boats to be deployed in MPAs. Um, you know, it's a, it's an, a fairly affordable boat to produce, you know, could potentially be deployed in, in fleets. They could monitor for a range of things from detecting illegal fishing to monitoring for environmental health monitoring a um, variety of oceanographic conditions. Um, so you could provide clarity to some of these MPAs and help really protect them. And you know, as we, as a globe, look at protecting you know, 30% of our oceans by 2030, we really do have to look at innovative ways to monitor them. Um, because the reality is that that monitoring and reporting and is, is a very important part of this equation. And I do think USVs like ours that are completely zero emission, easy to control, can go in a range of conditions, can be scaled, ha have the potential to, to shift that. And I mean, that's, a, that's the very key factor that has driven me to co-found this company is that you know, I believe we need better ways of seeing our ocean. And, you know, I spent five months rowing across the Atlantic Ocean. I know just how big it is, just how difficult it is to be out there. And it's hard for boats to go out there, it's, and it's expensive. But if you can send little robot boats that are safe, sustainable, um, it could be a very good solution. Julie is always a good one for enthusiasm and like <laughs> reminding us about the opportunities and the challenges. I love it. Thanks, Julie. Bob, any, any comments on what you, as more of the end user, you called yourself yeah, a consumer. Yeah, like, I think it's, just, it, it's exciting for me to work with technology providers and try and find these solutions. 
And then, you know, there's so many choices out there that it's really exciting to try and tailor the technology to a particular situation and then potentially scale that up and replicate that in more places. So I think, you know, some of the projects that we've been working on, this MPA bot project that we're still continuing to work on, seeing the fruits of that labor is just really exciting to me. No, that's great stuff. So I didn't do this on purpose, but I'm going to take us down sort of a challenge angle again, and, and I, I hate to do it. You've, you've got several engineers or engineering-minded people here. As much as we engineers, like, pretend it's not true, the world is full of lawyers and accountants as well, right? So my, my, my question here is, and we've talked about people. They're people too, um, but red tape, right? So uh, we're working with sophisticated techs. We're working with marine protected areas that, by definition, bring with them rules, regulations, requirements. And so I just like, I'm, I'm asking here more maybe for some lessons learned or experiences or ideas you've, you've come across about, um, you know, what have you run into in, in terms of trying to bring tech into a marine protected area or an analogous application? And any lessons learned or thoughts about how we can continue as a, as a team, as a community to, to move the ball forward and not be unduly tied up by red tape? And you can pass on this one too. I realize that, like you know, um, but but you know, what what are you, what are you seeing out there that, that's maybe slowing down the tech? I think for us, it's you know engagement early and often with the relevant authorities. So as we want to conduct a, an, an operation, whether it's monitoring or enforcement with a particular set of technologies, um, engaging early with the governments, uh, making sure that you have all the permits in place and making sure that they're aware of what you're doing and best case scenario, they're engaged. So going to identify their problem areas and how the tech should, could potentially solve those, uh, solve those problems that they've identified and getting their engagement is the best way to get your tech involved in that particular location. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Um, I would say, uh, you know, our experience uh, has been on the regulatory side with uncrewed surface vehicles. And, uh, you know, in, in Canada, when we first started this company in, in 2018, there really weren't any regulations around how you operated them. And then Transport Canada put in regulations. And in that interim period, we weren't allowed to be on the water. So we couldn't do testing. We couldn't do deployments, nothing. Um, and, you know, we worked with Transport Canada and others to help um, inform those regulations and we have you know a close relationship with them and now of course we're fully permitted to, to operate but still uh, because this is new technology and because sometimes there is risk that is perceived that is not necessarily uh, relevant, it's very important to, to speak with those agencies. And when you think about regulation on surface vehicles, it's much different if it's, you know, a 300-pound, uh, you know, boat that goes the speed of a floating log um, versus if it's a fully <laughs> autonomous uh, freighter. Um, so it's really important to have those communications, work with the regulators, work with them early on and keep them informed. All right, moderator's prerogative to tell very quickly an old guy story. Uh, when I, as a student, tried to put a robot boat in Boston Harbor called the Coast Guard, got a few sentences into explaining what I was doing and, and the phone went dead, right? It's like actual phones back in the day, they weren't cellular, right? I'm like, huh, I'm call back, you know, talk to the same gentleman, and, you know, and it's like, phone went dead again. And I called back and I said, I don't know what's going on. He said, kid, Stop, I'm hanging up on you because if you keep telling me what you're trying to do, I'm gonna have to say no. <laughs> right? He's like, he's, he's like, stop talking to me because if you talk to me, I'm gonna have to say no. And, and you're a student and I don't wanna have to say no. It's gotten a lot better, right? Um, and, and I actually, your, your timeline is fabulous, right? You know, it, from not being able to work to being able to work. I applaud Transport Canada for, for working with you on that. But sorry to cut off. Um, if others wanna comment on, uh, just, on. Just a small one. So because our vehicles, they're, they're subsea vehicles, but they do come to the surface, so we are starting to have to um, address the same issues that, that uh, Julie's uncrewed vessels do. But as I was thinking about this, I, I just kept, my mind just kept going, hmm, regulations, risks, insurance, uh, insurance, and uh, insurance costs are difficult for when you're trying to do things that are new and, and groundbreaking and extremely expensive and difficult to find people that will even insure you for these operations. 
I got another story on that one, sorry. <laughs> Lloyd's of London doing a risk analysis, learning about risk. Again, this is well over 10 years ago. And, and the question was, like, if we design better robots, can we get lower insurance premiums, right? As a, as a designer, like, where does it come in? And the, the insurance people looked at me really funny, like, what do you mean? I'm like, I'm like well, hold on, what if we built in safety systems and all of this? And, and the conversation was going nowhere. So I said, okay, let's start over. Can you tell me how you price insurance on these ocean robots now? And they said, oh, that's really easy. I said, great, what do you do? They said, we ask for the resume of the ship's captain and the crew and the pro, like, like the, the robot was irrelevant. <laughs> it was what's going on, and, and the price tag. Sorry, it was how much does it cost, what's the capital cost, and what is the pedigree of the people using it? It could have been a, a washing machine. Like it could, it didn't, the fact that it was a robot was completely irrelevant to the way they priced risk, yeah. right? They have gotten a little bit better, but, but that was not all that long ago. Anyway, Derek, did you want to chime in on, on the red tape question? Um, uh, so as far as red tape is concerned, I think uh, most of our red tape that we've run into has been more on the aerial vehicle uh, side of things. So the one comment I think I would make in reference to MPA is that uh, red tape and, and regulations actually provide us with an opportunity to answer with technology. Um, so. Uh, in a way, it's kind of a positive thing. So no downer on this one, Justin. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Derek's bringing the energy back up. So there we go. We have a question from the audience. Oh, what? Oh, oh, I don't know about that guy. <laughs> Chris, Chris, you promise it's an appropriate question. <laughs> Chris Roper is a longtime contributor here too. Thank. What do you have, Chris? Uh, turtles. Turtles. Um, for the last year, and, and this is just a cautionary note, for the last year we've been waiting on permitting that's based around turtles. And uh, we're doing a project in Hawaii. We're using a wave generator to power the AUV, but we've got green turtles in the area. And nobody thought about turtles at all during the initial, so we're a year behind schedule, and the permitting is contingent on turtle. And so what we're having to prove is that, that lighting on board doesn't affect turtle, uh, laser on board doesn't affect turtle. And I'm just bringing this up just to say that no matter what you plan, there's always a turtle in the puddle somewhere. Because, it, and, and be aware of this, because um, it, it's not easy. It's a Navy project, and it's the Navy that is having the problem with the permitting of the turtle. So the red tape is a, it, it's really red. No, right on. And it's, so Chris is, works with an organization, more robots, more projects. Glad, glad to hear you in Hawaii. We should all go to good places. And it's an awesome segue to a question I wanted to present to our panelists. And, and we promised Sabine we'd be out of here roughly at, at five minutes before the half hour. So the next panel can be on schedule. So we're winding down. And the fun question I'd like to throw out here is, you know, what marine protected area would you be most interested sort of in visiting? Maybe it's with your technology, maybe it's on vacation, I don't care, but like what MPA are you most excited about? And maybe a little bit about why, right? This is more about the MPA side than the tech side. So, and if you haven't thought about it and you don't know where any MPAs are, <laughs> just tell me what beach you want to go to, just play along, right? <laughs> Anybody have any thoughts on, on the most excited? This is a sort of a personal value judgment question, right? Anybody want to admit to an opinion? Yeah, go ahead, please. So I'm very new to the um, marine protected areas. And just in the past while, as we've been talking about the things that we've been asked to look at, I, I mentioned in my talk the glass sponges are fascinating to me, both just to see what they're like, the fact that people didn't even know that there were still some living ones. Uh, talking to Sabina just earlier today, I didn't realize that. And one thing we've been talking about just from a purely technical side, which I mentioned is, I believe we can, well I know we can make a, a vehicle that would be fabulous at mapping these things and, and photographing them. And, um, but can we actually detect them with sensors so that we can position off them and not collide with them? And. And uh, this kind of a segues into an idea that, that Jackie and I were talking about is that one of the main reasons that we're here is to talk about bringing data about these marine protected areas 
to the public. Like people haven't ever seen these things before. And so if they don't see them, they don't think about them. And so we've got the opportunity to, to image these, these things, monitor them, uh, monitor how they're changing, uh, finding um, incidents that would damage them, and, and bringing the whole awareness to the right surface, on. so to speak. Other thoughts, MPAs you want to visit and why? For me, I mean, I've been so fortunate to visit so many of these iconic MPAs, it's really hard for me to pick. But if I was to give my recommendation on where to go, Cocos Island, it's amazing. All right, right on. Derek, Julie, any thoughts? You don't have to answer if you don't have. Well, someplace nice and warm, uh, maybe the Bahamas. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I, I think our goal would be to um, be deployed in an MPA where there's a defined illegal fishing challenge and be able to monitor and report on that in an effective way. And, and that is an example of an MPA that does have challenges. Cool. Any thoughts, Derek? I've never thought of a specific one I would want to visit, if I'm honest, but I find them all fascinated, and I think it's important to protect them. I, I got one more, sorry. I would really love to send our Solus LR vehicle off the coast of the west coast of Vancouver Island out to the thermal vent areas, mm. survey those, those thermal vent areas, and come back to the coast and be recovered on the beach and get that data back, and then maybe send another one out in the, in the meantime and just get all that. What is, I've seen uh, geothermal vents um, through a TV camera of remote operated vehicles and they're fascinating. And I'd love to see what our own ones look like. Right on. The, uh, the ulterior motive for that as the final question becomes one of, so you've got a crowd of technologists and consumers and users very interested in MPAs. Here we are at Impact 5. And so the flip back ask to admittedly, this audience, the group of us here may not be the right ones, the folks in the live stream, the folks upstairs, I think you have a lot of innovators who would like nothing better than to hear about your needs and hear about your requirements. So we had some specific examples of how we think we can get involved with MPAs and do good. I guarantee you we don't know them all. We are missing a lot of information and what we're, we're here speaking, we're up front, we're communicating out, but we're also here to receive. So as we wind down, I'm hoping every one of us hears from somebody here about an MPA that, and an MPA application that we don't yet know about. So with that, thank you for our time. I'll hand it back over to Sabine for the next panel. Don't go anywhere, because the next one's even better. <laughs>